Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be back here in front of the economic matter. I'm, I'm sorry, we're at ENT. <laughs> I've, I've spent more time in your committee with all due respect than I have my own. Um, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, could I play a short, maybe 10, 15 second video that we're going to run th throughout? You might hit, it should be the one right there. Double click. Got it. Is there volume on this? <coughs> okay. Island is the beautiful place that we all blow by as we're rushing to get to the beach. But as anyone who has gone to the beach knows on Sunday, ooh, talk about gridlock, you'll sit on Kent Island for hours leading up to the Bay Bridge. Well, now drivers are taking some local access roads and that's causing gridlock for local. Bay Bridge traffic is causing headaches for locals on Kent Island and officials are pushing to prevent out-of-towners from clogging up local roads. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think, uh, Vice Chairman, I'm sorry, promotion. Um, I've been in front of you all about some of the issues we have in, on, in Queen Anne's County, and, and I think you'll get the gist of it after we talk about this bill today. Um, many of you, as they said on that, that tape, have seen the problems. You could, if you've driven over there, if you have a place on a beach, you'll know what we're going through each day. We are gridlocked. We are stopped. I brought some people here today to talk about the bill, but let me explain what the bill does first. The bill will allow Queen Anne's County, as amended, I'm sorry, the bill will allow Queen Anne's County Board of County Commissioners to prohibit or restrict the operation of vehicles on certain state exit ramps when the Board of Commissioners has determined by resolution that the traffic is congested to the point that local traffic and emergency vehicles are unable to effectively navigate the area's high, the highway network. The restriction may put may be put in place if the county commissioner county determines that a state highway that crosses Maryland Route 50 in the county at grade or with a grade separation between Maryland Route 50 and the 301 split. And at that point, if you don't mind, I'd like to turn it over to my committee of uh, Commissioner Jim Moran. Oh, by the way, Delegate Aarons, for the record. Chairman, members, thank you for the opportunity to address Queen Anne's County's concerns about the traffic congestion along Route 50 leading up to the Bay Bridges on Sundays in our county as the need to control access to Main Street during these massive backups. In a short time, each of us will be speaking on how these backups are impacting our citizens, our health, our Department of Emergency Services, our volunteer fire departments, and our businesses. I will start by trying to explain our situation. Nowhere else in Maryland or the country do we have a bridge that, when closed, will cause a detour of 148 miles to go around to the north or 429 miles to go around to the south, and that is from Kent Island to Annapolis. Since the second Bay Bridge opened in 1973, additional lanes have been added to Maryland Route 2, U.S. Route 50 has expanded to three lanes, I-97 was constructed, adding four lanes, Maryland 404 has been widened to four lanes, and most recently, the Middletown-Delaware bypass opened, adding lanes to US-301, which leads to the bridge. All these corridors contribute to traffic crossing the same five lanes of the Bay Bridge. All travelers must go through this corridor to cross the bay. It is the only one. In 1973, when the second span opened, there were 7.5 vehicles that crossed those bridges. Last year, 27 million vehicles crossed those same two bridges. Everyone goes to the beaches on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But everybody has to come home, and they come home on Sunday night, and that is our nightmare. Since the Route 5301 split, or excuse me, from the Route 5301 split in Queenstown, it is approximately 10 miles to the Bay Bridge. There are only two routes that span that distance. One route is Route 50. The other route is 18, Route 18, which we call Main Street. Route 18 Main Street is the only connection we have for all of our local communities, Centerville, Queenstown, Graysonville, Chester, and Stevensville. This one-lane road with no shoulders, open ditches, and no turning lanes is what 28,000 residents use to move about the county. The local response to beach traffic is to stay home. Residents on Kent Island now stay home on Sundays. They do not go out to eat. They don't go shopping. They don't plan work because it's uncertain how long a trip may take. A routine 20-minute trip to the store may now be extended by hours. As a community of less than 50,000 residents, the impact of 27 million trips crossing Kent Island and the Bay Bridge is significant. The vast majority of these trips are through traffic with origins and destinations far beyond our county borders. In the past three years, the state has added a lane on the Seven River Bridge and is removing the toll booths eastbound now. While these improvements help Anne Arundel County and the Broadneck Peninsula, they do nothing for westbound backups in Queen Anne's County. 
And I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Corcorino. Bless you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Chris Corcorino, Queen Anne's County Commissioner from District 4, and I'm here to testify in favor of House Bill 688. My district is located on Ken Island, which is the area of Queen Anne's County that gets hit first and hardest by Bay Bridge gridlock. Many in my community commute to, your, to work in your communities, including firefighters, nurses, and police officers who spend their week serving your citizens. When not working, they want to be able to pursue happiness back home in Queen Anne's County, but many weekends they cannot enjoy life's simplest events. They routinely cannot get their kids to games. They miss birthday parties. Our large senior population cannot spend a leisurely Sunday watching their grandkids play while enjoying a family cookout. We cannot even run up the store to buy diapers, milk, or medicine. This is because when the Bay Bridge hits capacity, transient traffic diverts off Route 50 onto Route 18. Our main street becomes gridlocked. Once Main Street comes to a halt, the damage is done. Backups ripple through the entire island into Graysonville and Queenstown. We are the only county in Maryland where a five-mile backup will imprison half of our population. With more than a decade before a new bay crossing and traffic projected to increase significantly, there is a compelling interest for the state to take action. House Bill 688 has been narrowly tailored to address this compelling interest. On behalf of the citizens of Queen Anne's County, I am asking you to give House Bill 688 a favorable report. And I'll turn it over now to Dr. Ciotola. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Joseph Ciotola. I've been a licensed physician in the state of Maryland for 42 years as an orthopedic surgeon. I'm also, at this point in time, acting as not only the jurisdictional medical director for Queen Anne's County, but also their health officer. The issues that we bring forth to you today are no longer inconvenience. We are now talking about the risk to health and safety of well-being for the majority of the population of Queen Anne County and its visitors. In the years of my training and work at the R. Adam Cowley Shock Trauma Center, one of the prominent guiding principles for treatment and intervention was time time-sensitive treatment. As you all know, and as a, as a professional in medicine, hypoxia or a lack of oxygen to the brain causes further destruction of neurons. Loss of blood to the cardiac muscle causes dead muscle and eventually complete heart stoppage. We have come to a point in time with the gridlock that we sustain specifically on Sunday afternoons and Sunday evening, to the point where we're having significant difficulty responding in a timely, effective manner to any emergency in Queen Anne County, specifically from that 5301 split at Queenstown. The other thing you have to understand, we are one of two jurisdictions in the state of Maryland that do not have a hospital. That means every transport we do with a critical patient has to be out of the county. We have a freestanding emergency room in Queenstown, which will take some priority, but our critical patients have to go out of the county. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to seriously consider what we're facing, and this can only be solved with collaboration between state and local authorities to come up with provisions to address this emergency. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, committee, I want to thank you for letting me testify today. My name is Scott Haas. I'm director of Queen Anne's County Emergency Services. I want to compliment what Dr. Ciotola said and give you some ideas of four phases of our EMS response and some time frames for this. So our first phase in EMS response is receiving the 911 call. Once we receive the 911 call, the call is dispatched and emergency responders respond. Typically in Queen Anne's County, we're bedside at patient side within nine to 11 minutes of that 911 call. During the traffic inconveniences, we typically increase our times to about 25 minutes to our worst case scenario in 2019 of 40 minutes to get to side of patient from the time of the 911 call. Part two, which Dr. Ciotola highlighted, we do not have a, a hospital within our borders. 
Our average transport time on a normal day is 28 minutes to a receiving facility for transporting a critical patient. During these tra traffic increases in, on our Sunday transports, these transport times increase to approximately 45 to 60 minutes, with our worst case scenario being about 67 minutes last year. And in a time sensitive case, in, in our opinion, that is unacceptable and it basically is life or death for a patient to get to a receiving facility. Part three of our response is the dilemma that we're faced with our hospitals, which really isn't part of the traffic scenario, but it's part of the scenario that we face. And we're constantly faced with hospitals on alert status that we have to bypass and go to another facility, which increases our transport times. And then when we can be accepted into the facilities, uh, our worst, worst case scenario for 2019 is we had a three and a half hour wait from the time that our transport unit pulled into the receiving facility until the patient was offloaded into a bed in a room. The fourth part of our, our, or our fourth phase of, of our transport or our response is uh, returning home. And returning home is just as difficult as it is getting to the hospital. The only difference is we're not responding with lights and sirens on the, on the return home. If, if you wouldn't mind wrapping up. Thank okay. You. We just strongly uh, urge you to support House Bill 688. And if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Thank you. Uh, is Sheriff Hoffman here? I am. Okay. Mr. Vice Chair, thank you. And the committee as well. Good afternoon. I'm Sheriff Gary Hoffman. I've served with Queen Anne's County since 2006. Um, I've been in Queen Anne's County uh, as a sheriff for the last 14 years, worked there over 28 years. Seen a lot of changes in Queen Anne's County. and. One of the things that um, I'm kind of hoping I can do is read this, but I've had to adjust the font so I can see this. When I was younger, I didn't need contacts, and now I seem to. But one of the things that I adjusted in life was adapting and changing, kind of like why we're here today, um, adapting and adjusting to the changes and challenges that time has given all of us. You've heard testimony or will that we live on an island, and the majority of the artery runs straight through Queen Anne's County and completely cuts Kent Island in half. As a law enforcement official, it makes it very difficult for response time to our community, especially when traffic is slow or not moving at all. Most will tell us, you know, Sheriff, use your lights and siren to get through the traffic. Well, that works really well if there's a place for those cars to go or there is a shoulder for those vehicles to go on. Easy enough to maneuver when there's not traffic, but when there is traffic, there's a huge delay in our response time. In fact, most of Route 18 doesn't even have a shoulder. It's a hazard for both the first responders as well as the community that we serve. Often, as you know, technology is now moving traffic off of Route 50 and through our local neighborhoods and communities. It's creating problems for those local neighborhoods that were never, ever, ever supposed to have the Waze app or other thing diverting traffic through. I've personally had many community members that have called me to say, oh my gosh, I'm expecting a child. How am I supposed to get to Anne Arundel when this backup occurs? What happens if, what happens if, what happens if we need the police? Sadly, we've had to tell them that probably there's going to be a delay in response. We've strategically tried to move police officers around the county to make sure that we have a slow response, I'm sorry, a short response time to reduce that. Unfortunately, we have seen delays. Um, motorists are frustrated. We've seen motorists get out of cars and have fights. They've thrown water bottles, sodas at each other. We've had road rage incidents and accidents. I'm asking that all of you favorably understand our concerns, and I am asking that you support House Bill 688 to at least help us prevent our community as we change and the roadway infrastructure changes to better serve the citizens of Maryland and Queen Anne's County. Thank you, Mr. Reister. Thank, thank you. I see a couple of folks have come up to the witness table, but we do have uh, several delegates who had questions for the previous witnesses. So, so, so I'd like to go to them first, if you don't mind, and then we can take your testimony. Thank you. Delegate Harrison. Thank you. And um, the sheriffs um, began to um, allude to the, the first part of my question. Um, let me say from the outset, I totally understand what it is that you all are talking about. And while I don't live there, I can certainly understand and feel your pain, having been stuck in the traffic myself and didn't know that there were <laughs> alternative routes. But those individuals who may not travel um, back and forth regularly, like they may have been their first time over to the shore, and they're using an application such as Waze, and Waze 
tells them to go this way, and they really don't have any idea. How do you um, how do you propose to deal with um, with those individuals? And um, you, I'll, I'll just go through all of the questions. Is there a penalty? I didn't see a penalty that was um, listed in the bill. And then um, how do you deal with locals versus non-locals who may be traversing these areas because Waze has sent them there? We have actually had a lot of contact where community members or people that are traveling through the area have stopped and asked deputies, what's the quickest way to get through? And if they stay on Route 50, they're really happy to follow our advice to say, if you stay on 50, it really is the quickest. Because it is one way off the island, which is the Bay Bridge, and then there's two arteries, the Route 18 and Route 50. The problem is, is that you can only put so much through that funnel when it gets onto the Bay Bridge and all those side arteries are feeding into it. Uh, most of the public is very receptive, too, and I've had a lot of contacts with the public, um, both locals staying on Route 18, and then people that are coming from and to the beach are very happy to know that if 50 stays flowing and they don't have all that interference from those side ramps coming on, that 50 does move faster and it is much quicker. Um, to address the second part of your question, um, the county commissioners, I believe, and I don't want to speak for them, uh, President Jim Rand, have looked at some type of system, whether it be a placard or a sticker, and I think it's better. We, we would develop a, a decal for the residents of Queen Anne's County, so when they come up to some of these exits, they would just automatically just be able to wave right through. And then there is, is there um, a penalty for, like I said, those individuals who may not know and, you know, ways or whatever other wayfinding app has taken them in a different direction that may put them on one of your local roads? No, there, there is no penalty. Uh, and, and also, you know, another thing I want to stress is if somebody comes up to, if a deputy is sitting at a ramp and, and we're monitoring the traffic to keep Route 18 open, and somebody pulls up there and says, I'm going to my uncle's house, I'm going to my brother's house, I'm going to this store, we let them through. We don't, we don't question them, we don't grill them. It's just, it's more, as the sheriff said, is to educate them, to show, look, it's staying on 50 will be your quick, quickest way, but a lot of people just don't buy into that because it weighs. So you anticipate then that, you know, that there will be a sheriff or someone located at these exit ramps, so Our to speak. Our preference would be using approved uh, roadway barrier devices, but I think you would still have to have some law enforcement, you know, in the area in case somebody decided to push barriers out of the way. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, next question goes to Delegate. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you uh, so much for bringing this to our attention. I, uh, like the uh, delegate said, I certainly uh, sympathize. Um, there's nothing like being caught in traffic, and I myself just going back to Baltimore City leave here at a certain time because it's um, it's hard. But I wanted to address um, MDOT's letter about um, uh, they have not uh, given a position, but they have stated that um, there's currently um, – a process. Uh, local governors may request closure of a state highway by submitting a permit application with MDOT and SHA, um, and and they make this. Um, they speak more about this in a way of cl collaboration um, and being collaborative with um, the state and the local um, entities. And I just wanted to uh, ask um, maybe why this process doesn't work for you versus this bill. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can answer that one. We, we uh, have, in, in layman's terms, lobbied the state for the last three to sure. four years about our traffic issues and what can be done and coming up with ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me. And every year, those, those ideas have been shot down. Last year, uh, we asked, we have a beach-to-bridge plan uh, uh, the, for dealing with these exits and certain ones being closed that are really going to nowhere and, and other ones being monitored. Uh, there's four locations where you cross over Route 50, uh, and we, we were going to monitor those. And, and the state looked at our, our plan and, and then came back and, and basically said that, no, we can't authorize that. At this, this was a, a plan to get the permit? To yes. Okay. This is a plan Thank for you. us asking them for their permission, their support with this. And they came back and, and said no. Um, and literally uh, months later, they actually helped us close a couple of the ramps. So I think... Collaborative is, is the right word that I would use, and we are looking forward to working with them on this issue. But as it stands right now, this is really Queen Anne's County's only option. Oh, okay, and I, and I did want to follow up with the delegates' actual question about really the distinction of knowing who is who. Like, I mean, it, it feels like there's a lot of man hours to, or woman hours, or they hours, staff hours, excuse me, um, to 
Um, it's because they're all men, so it's just like, I just said men. Um, um, to to kind of have somebody on the road to discern, to see who is who, you know, the decal versus having to talk to someone to say that they're, you know, going to visit a family member or maybe they're the person who didn't put the decal on the time. So I'm just really talking about um, the the work, it, it seems like, that would have to be done to 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 kind of distinguish who can get off on the route and who, who cannot. So I'm just want, can you talk no, a little absolutely. bit about I mean, those it, logistics? It is, it is the, the implementation is, is something that we are, it, it's, it's a living organism. We, we are adapting it. Last year we closed them a couple times. We've, we've monitored them, monitored them. But again, we don't deny anybody access that has sure. somewhere they're going. But if they're going to the beach, we tell them to stay on 50. It is the quickest. We are making decals for residents, mm -hmm. so for their kids, for their relatives, whomever that are coming to visit. So we don't, we don't, uh, you know, the, the citizens, the, the choice we have is to do nothing. Sure. And, and that's just, it just, the Queen Anne's County is, is dying a slow death because sure. of this traffic on Sundays. So this is really what we're left with. So the, the decals are the first thing for the local residents. Uh, the deputies on key ramps that have access uh, to sensitive areas of, of the county, because sure. a lot of these, again, won't need to be monitored by deputies, but we, we envision that at least four to six will be needed. And again, it's only on Sunday evenings right now, because that's when our traffic backs up to 10 to 12 miles. And, and then my last question, um, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. Um, um, it, is this seasonal? So what time of year does this, is this the worst versus when it's not? Correct. And, and that it is. It is seasonal. So, but as we've noticed now, in Ocean City and the Delaware beaches, there's less than 10,000 people who live there year round, sure. but they balloon to 700,000 in the summer. Okay. So, you know, and now Ocean City seems to be a destination for all the way through October. Sure. And we've noticed that last fall with more backups. I mean, we went three years ago, we were lucky to have four backups. Now we're looking at at least 60 to 70 percent of Sundays at five miles and greater for backups. And we have four last year that were 12 miles. So we're we talking about between like spring and fall? Through From, fall. Through fall. Through fall. Correct. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Next question goes to Delegate uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Uh, do any of you know of any other situation in the state of Maryland where this is this is allowed? Is this setting a precedent for that that's never been done before? Well, yeah, I, I, I think that the, the 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 bill, yes, it, it would set precedents. I think, but again, you know, I, I, being a, a Marylander all my life, at the Naval Academy when they have a football game, they close ramps. Sure. It, it's event, it, you know, it's event traffic. Uh, management and so anytime there's you know in Annapolis if they have an event they close roads and, and this is to move the traffic and, and help alleviate the congestion so you know yes it, you know I, I would say yes to, to the short answer is yes but it's not that they don't do it already in the state I think they do it at most of the sporting events and other mm -hmm. other major events okay I appreciate that thank you mm -hmm. thank you and thank you for bringing this bill and I understand the issue, of course, it's only um, westbound, eastbound traffic's fine, right? Correct. So it's only Sunday afternoons. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, we do something like this. It's going to affect the restaurants. Have they been conferred with? Yes, they have. And, so and we, um, our economic development director is going to address that. We've done a study of, I think, 150 businesses, and 85% of the businesses are affected on Sunday evening traffic, and 45% are affected severely. But we don't intend to close, like for instance, the Kent Narrows, those ramps will remain open. They will, you know, we are not, we are not in this to hurt our businesses, we're in this to help our businesses, but, because you'll see a lot of times as you watch these videos, people will not get out of that queue. If they get out of that queue to stop at a restaurant, they know it's gonna even be worse and they'll be further back in the queue. So we feel that that's, that's an issue. So, you know, we, we are, again, not closing some of the main ones to uh, traffic to, and anybody that says they want to go to a restaurant, a business, a, a residence, we allow them to pass through. And as it is now, we have existing restaurants that are now choosing to close on Sundays because the patrons can't get there because of the traffic. I know about Chick-fil-A, but no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting that you would keep the ones on Kitten Airs open. I was wondering if perhaps you could just close all of them except for like Route, Route 8, I guess Maryland 8, Roman Coke Road, and then they could go backwards. Because if you did, if everything was closed except for that one, 
than Waze or anything else, they wouldn't direct them to go to the side streets because it's not going to help them at all. Well, also, when Waze realizes there's deputies and people report there's a deputy at this ramp, Waze also turns the direction to a different route. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but that to travel that distance from the 5301 split to the Bay Bridge, when it's backed up that far, it's every bit of two hours. So, you know, for locals or, for instance, the hospital will be the first exit. We want to make sure we monitor that so if anybody has medical issues, they can get to our emergency, our standing, standalone emergency room. It's not a hospital. Uh, and same with some of the other locations. I was just listening to, I guess, the sheriff's office. Um, that would definitely require someone to be there. Correct. You couldn't use that. So I guess you'd have to man it. Absolutely. One of those. Yes. We, we anticipate we'll have to manage at least four to six exits. So, that, again, local citizens can move, move about, people going to visit relatives, people coming to visit businesses will still have access. Well, and for locals, you could have an educational campaign. It's not that we're not talking that many people who are actually on the island. If you made it, I'm supportive of what you're trying to do. I guess I'm trying to, like, engineer it. Mm -hmm. But, but um, it would be nice to have less, I think, than four to five from what you were talking about. Maybe just have one or two and then... Direct everybody else to the far, and hopefully after after months of this, you know, I mean, this is, you know, I, I tell people all the time, this isn't so much uh, important as it is today, as it will be in three years. I mean, a, a new crossing is not coming for ten, twelve, fourteen years, right. and this traffic is getting exponentially worse every year. Great. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Next question goes to Delegate Layman. Thank you. Um, and, and I, like my colleagues, can certainly, um, you know, relate to this, to the kind of congestion this um, must cause and consternation for local residents. But um, first, to clarify, um, I look through this a couple of times, and I don't see a specific mention of the highway in question, but I assume it's Route 18. Is that correct? Primarily? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so Route 18 is about 20 miles long. So mm -hmm. what do you, there's no specification that I can tell on how much of this you're talking about. Um, and so could someone describe From Queenstown, it? Queenstown's the Route 5301 split on the Eastern Shore. That's Queenstown. Route 18 runs through Queenstown all the way up through Centerville. <clears throat> but we're, we're referencing from Queenstown to the Bay Bridge. So of the 20 miles, roughly how much 50 is Fifty percent of it, about 10 miles of it. Okay. And so going back to um, Delegate Harrison's question about enforcement, um, we're at the bottom of page two. It talks about um, the, the way you would, you know, you would, you would um, do these restrictions and enforce them would be through signs, uh, barriers, and law enforcement. Um, you know, it would seem to me if you're talking about a system for locals of a decal of some kind, the, the only way you really could do this effectively would have to be with, with people, with human beings. Mm -hmm. And the, the fiscal note doesn't reflect that. Hey, you know, how much thought have you been given to what that will cost your county to do this, first of all? Well, I think, Sheriff, do you want me to answer that? Or you want yeah. You? Uh, I mean, okay. we, last year, we, we, in 2019, the summer of 2019, we budgeted $50,000 for overtime for our deputies to sit on these ramps and monitor them. So, you know, we, we feel that, Right now, we're sitting at looking at something that's at least fifty thousand dollars, possibly a hundred thousand dollars. But, but you haven't done it yet on this, you know, the way it's being described. Well, no, feels... that's because the county is consuming that cost. Okay. And is is this okay? Yeah. Okay, so that's... It's, yeah, we're, we're not asking, you know, okay. again, we're some of some of those ramps, man, um, actually overlap where you can circle back. So some of those with a structural barrier or you know roadway barriers would be sufficient mm -hmm. so that the resident or business patron could go to the next exit, come back around. So we would actually be reducing. It would be limited manpower mm -hmm. as far as law So then how do you, okay, that's helpful. Then how do you deal with this? Someone who is, is not a local and would be passing through. What about um, passers through who have medical emergencies of their own? They're, they're sick. They need to pull off their, their kids are sick or, or something. How, how is, how would that be handled, especially if it's just a physical barrier and not a person to allow them through? Well, for, first off, where the physical barriers are, those are very small non basically non usable streets they, their access is to specific communities the the major four exits the, the four ramps coming on route 50 uh, westbound those major exits will always be monitored and the first one you come to is the the uh, standalone emergency room so yes i mean if somebody's ill you know they, one call 911 but two they will be they will be able to get off at any one of those that they desire the ones where the barricades are you really come off the ramp and then it'll stop you from getting access to it uh, a community street okay and if we if we don't do this those 
those passers through who are looking for medical care, they would hit gridlock and they would not be able to get to emergency rooms. So this plan also helps everybody who is coming through if they need emergency services. And, and your constituents who are on the way home from the beach, if they have a medical emergency when they're coming through Queen Anne's County, they want our emergency services to be able to get to them. And as it is now, they can't. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, confirm a few things which I was hoping would be in the fiscal note, but it's, they're not. And then I guess you guys haven't submitted a written testimony either, not showing up. So how many days in 2019 did you incur this problem, which, which is, you know, like medically uh, threatening? For people? How many days are we talking about? How many days in 2019 did we have deputies on the ramps? Is that no, how many days did you, uh, in 2019, was when this traffic situation happened where traffic had to be diverted? Like, I'm trying to estimate how many days would you be doing this if the bill is passed. So I, can, I, would, I would say this I mean, year, I'd say at least 50% of the Sundays, at least. And I would say three years from now, probably 75 sir, to 80%. 2019. 2019 full year, how many days did you have this problem? The traffic. Just yeah, just, where, just, which, which is going to be helpful once if the bill is passed and you have the right to do. I'd say four out, four out of, or excuse me, three out of four Sundays. So what, we are we talking about like 40 Sundays every I, I, I would say, so uh, minus 12, Sundays. so 40 okay, Sundays. Okay, hold on. Everybody settle down in the committee and let's let him answer, and then you can follow up. Yes. So if I understand you correctly, in 2019, I would say from uh, May through, and I'll be conservative and say May through September, it was probably 75% of those Sundays absolutely had a backup. So and the major ones, the ones that are 10 or 12 miles, that was probably one out of four. So, so should I estimate that 40... Uh, out of 52 weeks uh, in a year, uh, or you would be needing to have this authority 75% of the year, which SHA is saying is going to create a problem for them, right? For 2020, I would probably say it would be more like 50%, but it, it is growing. So I do anticipate sooner or later we will get to that number. Yes, sir. Right. And, and so right now the patients, and I'm, being a physician, I'm more concerned about medical emergencies. Mm -hmm. So patients are what, medevac to hospitals if they are in a, in a serious condition? With the situation that we've had this past summer, with 2019 with the bridge, I had a conversation with State Medical Director Dr. Chismire and Dr. Flocare, as well as Dr. Delbridge, the Executive Director for MIMS. We have gotten authority to go ahead and request a launch of MSP Aviation for our Priority 1 patients for medical conditions, not just for trauma, but also any medical. And fortunately, we have not had to utilize that, but it is also weather dependent. You have to understand that if aviation is down, then we've got a bigger issue with no opportunity to get those patients to critical care. So are you saying right now you cannot use Medivac for, for anything which is not like no, we can trauma? Use, no, we have Medivac that we can use if time is critical for priority one and priority two, we will request MSP troopers. And you always get the medevac helicopters for emergencies? Because my previous experience is 30% of their fleet is out of order most of the well, days. We so have, have not, you had this instance? That, we have not had the incidents where we have not been able to get aviation because they weren't available. We have had incidences where weather has been the primary issue. And one last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did, I, did I hear you right? And you said that there is no hospital in the entire county? There is no hospital in Queen Anne County or Caroline County. Queen Anne County does have a freestanding emergency room, which is affiliated with the University of Maryland Shore Medical System. But it is essentially taking priority three and four patients. Sometimes we will divert for a priority two or one when we need stabilization of the airway. And how did that happen that two counties don't have any hospital? That's something that uh, has amazed me my entire career. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate next question time. will go to Delegate, if you could push your button off. Yes. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. 
is going to go to Jay Jacobs, who no doubt is going to advocate for a third and fourth bridge to alleviate. <laughs> <laughs> and they do as well, uh, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of questions. One, one uh, probably more so to the commissioner, one for emergency services, but of this panel. But um, Commissioner Moran, I think every year we have a CTP meeting, which everybody I, I believe in here has that um, exercise each year. And Queen Anne's County, I think, has offered some very good plans through the years of trying to address this problem. And, you know, part of this is, and even in uh, uh, MDOT's letter, is about collaboration. And I know that it's taken a, sometimes longer to get an answer of, of, you know, something that really needs kind of immediate attention. Than we'd like. Of course, that's that's whenever you're in traffic jams, that's the way it is, I, I believe. But isn't it so that recently, with the Bay Bridge backups, which have been a whole nother layer on top of the issue that you're even talking about here, hasn't uh, MDOT or MDTA made kind of concessions in a way, but they've changed their plans. Uh, in a different direction than the, where they intended to go. They've collaborated in a different direction in order to make something happen quicker, to, you know, to soften the blow, so to speak, to, for the citizens. I mean, it, it, it's been horrific in the beginning. I know I've lost some voters over this one. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's really been a, 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 that on top of the Sundays has really been very difficult. But my point in this is with collaboration, there's there's some give and take on both sides in order to to reduce the impact of these problems and so I know that you guys have put on some good plans and this is one of them that's really been offered and and uh, you know I'm just trying to let the committee know that there's other things that have said they weren't going to do that in fact there's been a reversal in in order to to really make that plan work better that uh, that traffic situation worked better. They've kind of reversed their ideas and gone in a different direction. Isn't that true? Can yep. you speak to any of that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, there's two separate issues there. One with the redecking project that's that's going on on the on the westbound bridge now, and uh, you know, it, it is it is very uh, comforting to Queen Anne's County. The Secretary uh, uh, Slater has 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 reached out to us, and and you know, the collaborative we are working together uh, to deal with those issues with that project and that is going to be done a year in advance, and we are grateful for that. And I'm sure this summer all the, the beach traffic will be grateful for that also. Uh, I will say that Secretary Slater also last year, uh, you know, when when we wanted to close one of the ramps under Route 18, right in front of the outlet malls, it's a left-hand turn. We have to cross over traffic, very dangerous. Uh, you know, when we showed Secretary Slater the, the video of, of cars lined up to turn left that were actually lined up out onto Route 50 in the Hammer Lane, uh, he saw that as, a, as as dangerous, which we have been saying for some time, and he actually closed that ramp, and and hopefully we're working towards closing that permanently because that's just an accident waiting to happen. So, you know, we are, we are very supportive of of working with uh, MDOT and and uh, MDTA on these issues, and we know that, for instance, there's a couple locations in um, Route 50 right now where they have signs, the exit signs actually flip open. And when they flip open, it says local access no, only, no, no access to the Bay Bridge. And we'd love to see those at all the exits. And on Sundays, let's open all these up. And, and you know, that's, it, it's further with the education of, of the commuters. And I think that more and more commuters, as they see, sit in these 12-mile backups, realize, I can't leave now. I, I, it's better for me to leave tomorrow or the next day. And, and that helps alleviate some of our traffic issues. And I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, I know it's been a lot of just trying to think outside the Right. The box and outside the lines, and, and hopefully that will continue, and, and maybe a le piece of legislation like this can help in that regard. So my next question, uh, Dr. Ciatola and, and the Director of Emergency Services, you know, I was on Ammon's crew for 15 years, so volunteering, and, and so my I always think about that whenever we're into these traffic situations and how difficult it is to move people that are in peril, their, their life is in peril. And so can you just quickly 
run through what it's like on a Sunday with a priority one or a priority two patient. Just a normal backed up Sunday. Well, before you answer that, I, I want to set something else that we didn't even discuss yet. Route 18 between the 5301 split and the Bay Bridge, we have two volunteer fire departments there that handle the majority of the calls for the entire county. Kent Island Volunteer Fire Department, Graysonville Fire Department, and they are volunteers. So remember, when that traffic is sitting on Route 50 at a standstill, and as the picture you're looking at now, that is Route 18. When those cars are backed up on Route 18, we have an issue with getting our, our volunteers just to the house to run the calls. So that is also challenging. I'll let Dr. Ciotola talk about our emergency services. Well, Scott, you, you want to go ahead. You take or Scott, either one. So a, nor a normal transport in, in this scenario, we basically stack two units pretty close to the Bay Bridge. Uh, and we stack two units close to the Bay Bridge just because it's easier to go the opposite way in traffic. But typically in that area, it's our high call volume area because it's our most populated area. So those two transport units get eaten up very quickly and they're utilized very quickly. And that's when we get caught in the 40 minute scenario where we're trying to transfer a unit from the North County to South County to get into the hot zone of what we call the area that we need to run the most calls. So typically, uh, our first two runs that we run aren't as difficult as the following runs behind it. But if they get caught at the hospital and if they're delayed at the hospital, we just keep thinning out more and more per day. So if we have a high call volume day, we can have three or four transport units and we typically only have six in service trapped at the hospital before they can even return in service. And then they've got on, on a normal day, there's still traffic on the other side of the bridge that isn't affecting us on our side of the bridge, but they have to fight that to get back home. So we're just in this constant scenario of we've got a unit out of service, we're constantly in a, in a transport mode, and we just can't catch up when we're in this heavy traffic mode. And if, if you really get to the gridlock area, we, we can't in an emergency vehicle without the Sheriff's Office assistance get through that area whatsoever because Route 18, the majority of Route 18 has no shoulder. So there's nowhere for us to get around the traffic on Route 18. And then when you get on 50, everybody is pulling off because of Waze and Google onto Route 18. So the shoulder is blocked up with people trying to get off on Route 18 and without law enforcement's assistance, we wouldn't even have a shoulder on 50 to drive on. Yep. That hopefully answers your question. Yeah, I appreciate that. It gives, it gives everybody kind of and myself a little visual of what you have to go through. And my last short question is how, just roughly how many calls do you run on those Sundays when you have all gridlock? Well, Friday through Sunday is our high call volume days. Weekends is, is our most call volume. So typically on a normal day, we're running about 12 transports in this area during the busy hours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, you have my sympathy. This is a terrible situation. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, so if I understand right, the the um, the exits where which would be unmanned, is that the type of barrier that would go be triggered by the decal? No. Oh, it would just be something that people could go around? That, that's correct. It would. It, well, it, it, it would be a, a barricade, a, a Department of Public Works barricade, you know, caution, road closed. And we would move it on Monday mornings. So we would move it into place on Sundays, depending on the time of when the backups really start to go. The trigger point is exit 39A. When it backs up there, that's two and a half miles. That starts the mad rush to fill up Route 18. So when we see that, that's when we would, our Department of Public Works would actually handle those, setting those up on some of the roads. And if you're familiar with, with uh, the, the route, uh, there was, well, I, I, it's hard for me to explain to you and show you uh, which ones those would be. The, these... Where the barricades are, these are not highly traveled roads. So meaning that even if there was no backup, you're lucky to see one or two vehicles use that. But when their backup is, vehicles know to jump off and use that to get to around to Route 18. So my actual question is, what, what happens if somebody doesn't see a sign or whatever and they come off the exit? Is there a way for them to get back to Route 50 or are they stuck? That's correct. No, they can, they can get back to Route 50. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh -huh. There appear to be no further uh, questions for this uh, panel. Is this, um, uh, I see also signed up Todd Moan, uh, Heather Tonelli, 
uh, Tracy Schultz. Have, have those individuals uh, testified yet? No, sir, they have not. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you very much. I'll call up the uh, remaining witnesses, thank and you. they are Todd Moan, uh, Heather Tonelli, Tracy Schultz, Steve Cahoon, and Bruce Beriano. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Todd Mon, the County Administrator for Queen Anne's County. As you just heard from my county leadership, my county commissioners, and our very dedicated county public safety officials, we have an ongoing but very predictable problem with traffic congestion impacting our ability to provide essential public safety services. We find ourselves in a very unique and a very difficult position because this is a problem we never asked for. We didn't create it. It's also a problem we really don't want to manage, but it's a problem that will continue to dominate how we operate and live our lives for years to come if it's left unchecked in Queen Anne's County. These are state highways, and this is a statewide traffic capacity problem which creates gridlock on both the Main Line Route 50 and the only alternative local road leading to the Bay Bridge, Route 18. Today, as we've talked about, travelers almost exclusively use the navigational apps in their cars, ways, Google Maps, those apps reroute travelers to Maryland 18, and now even deeper and deeper into our local community roads. And this works well if there's an alternative road available, those apps. But in our Kent Island region, as you can see from these photographs, all the roads lead to the Bay Bridge. So the problem becomes an obligation of all of us to collectively address and solve this problem for our general public. So this bill allows our county to help manage traffic and improve safety during times of predictable high volumes as travelers return from the beach and during scheduled bridge construction projects like we have uh, ongoing right now. We also want to continue and understand we must work cooperatively, cooperatively with the Maryland Department of Transportation on this initiative to better manage traffic through the corridor. Uh, as we know, it's very, very constricted. We have discussed this problem with uh, Greg Slater, uh, the new secretary of MDOT, uh, during his tenure as uh, the SHA Administrator, and as my Commissioner uh, Moran mentioned earlier, he did help us close one of the ramps at Route 18 this past summer because he saw the problem himself. We look very much forward to working with him for additional solutions going forward. And in closing, I urge you to support House Bill 688 as an additional tool to provide Queen Anne's County the ability to assist with that traffic management initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who'd like to go next? Go ahead. Just... Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Heather Tonelli, and I'm the Director of Economic Development and Tourism for the county. So I'm here to talk to you today about what this means for our businesses. Uh, back in October of 2019, we did a survey, as Commissioner Moran had mentioned, of our local businesses to see what the impact is. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the county, and I remember traffic as long as I've been born. Um, however, it's progressively gotten worse and really started to affect our, our businesses. Um, from the respondents, we had 115 businesses that responded, and 85 percent, as Commissioner Moran had mentioned, were either significantly affected or had a, a moderate effect um, and slowdown for their business. All of them uh, indicated that there was a decrease in sales. Um, some of the other things that they mentioned is that their employees are unable to get there on time. For employees that travel, maybe like a cleaning crew or um, something of that nature, it takes them longer to get out, longer to get back. Um, they've heard from their customers, especially restaurants, you know, they want to get off, they, they want to go to these locations. However, uh, to get out of queue and get back in is just a delay in time, and they just get frustrated and they, they don't go. Um, another thing to think about is for the restaurants, let's say in the Kent Narrows area, if they have a significant decline in sales and people coming through those restaurants, then they end up uh, sending employees home. And if that happens consistently, you can understand that that means, you know, decreased employee wages. And it's just the whole ecosystem of the area as far as the businesses and our residents are affected by these changes. Um, our tourism industry countywide is 136 uh, million. We generate 18 million in sales tax and local tax revenues. And just the Kent Narrows alone, which is exit 42 in Graysonville, they uh, have $59.9 million in maritime revenues generated. And we think if, if the customers can't get there or they get frustrated and, and turn around, that over time is going to impact 
our businesses. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Okay, next. My name is Tracy Schultz, I'm Assistant Chief of the Canal Volunteer Fire Department. Um, as I said, Commissioner Moran stated, we are an all-volunteer department, which means that our station is not staffed with a paid crew who sit at the firehouse. We rely on our members who have to respond from home, work, or other locations that they might be at to staff our apparatus. This means that they have to drive to the firehouse, and this is where we run into the issue that we are trying to address today. They can't get to the firehouse. The traffic is so bad and at a standstill, blocking our members from being able to get to the firehouse so they can respond to the emergency. When a crew finally makes it to the firehouse, they have a difficult time responding in the back of traffic, which is usually from one end of Ken Island to the other. I was a driver of one of the fire trucks on a few calls that we had on Sundays. While there were extreme backups and all the motors who wanted to take the shortcuts blocked up Main Street. Main Street does not have shoulders on it through Stevensville and most of Chester. So when you try to drive a fire truck through stop traffic that can't move over because there's ditches and sidewalks there and nowhere to move over, you have to take the opposite lane, the oncoming lane of traffic to get through. That's about a two mile stretch of roadway that you're driving on the opposite side of oncoming traffic to get to the emergency. One of the other things that happens when we have backups, we have a plan in effect through the Department of Emergency Services, it's called Operation Bay Bridge. That is when the traffic backs up to an extreme amount that the emergency services can't transport to Anne Arundel Hospital. They transport mostly to the Queen ER, which is not set up, as Dr. Ciotola said, to handle cardiac stroke and other types of serious emergencies. That's uh, taken to the, e patients that are taken to the ER having serious complications have to be transported from the Queen ER to the appropriate hospital for treatment. So we're taking people to a hospital, to an ER, then they're being transported out to a hospital that can take care of their emergency. So just put yourself in a situation, how would you like to be having a stroke or cardiac issue where you need advanced intervention and you're transported to the Queen ER and you can't receive the advanced care that you might save, that might save your life because of a traffic backup? Thank you. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak. My name is Steve Cahoon, and I'm with the Queen Anne's County Department of Public Works. Um, we believe we have a unique situation and need unique tools to deal with it, and we think this bill helps us. Um, the corridor we're talking about is subject to the hourglass effect. All the regional highway systems funnel into a single uh, point crossing the bay, and that's the same five lanes crossing the bay that have been in place for many years. And the Bay Bridge is the center of the hourglass. Um, it's where everybody, everything comes together. Um, we have one of the most unique and vital segments of highway in the state of Maryland that runs from Queenstown across the Bay Bridge. This corridor is unique for many reasons. Um, it's the only bay crossing in Maryland. The capacity is limited. It's a 10-mile corridor with no alternative routes. It's one way in, one way out due to the ge geography of an island. Um, there's no options for additional lanes crossing the bay. Uh, all trips move to a single point, which is the Bay Bridge. Um, backups can occur quicker and take longer to clear because of the geography. The challenges we have um, with the daily dependence on contraflow are unique to this location. Um, apps do not work in this corridor and cre create new challenges because there's no alternative routes. It sends people in neighborhoods and there's no place for them to go. Um, this is more like an event. Um, than regular highway travel. Uh, but most importantly, the unique health, safety, and welfare challenges that come with the delivery of emergency services, um, they're unique in this corridor. Uh, we need special solutions to address this. We think this bill helps. Um, we look for, you know, we think this is a tool to help us manage the situation. We're asking for your help and your support on House Bill 688. All right, and finally, Mr. Bruce Beriano. Are you representing yourself or someone no, else? No, I, I have the honor, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee. I have the honor for the past three years of being the registered lobbyist for Queen Anne's County. Oh, all right. And I'm very honored to do that. Uh, I'll be brief. You heard a lot. First of all, on behalf of the county, I'd like to thank all of you for listening to this entire matter. Uh, it's a local bill with the amendments of Delegate Aaron's. But while it's a local bill and it's, it's a real problem, we're not complaining. We're explaining it and asking to assist us in dealing with it. But it affects all of us. We're all Marylanders, and we all go to Ocean City. We all go down to the Toss Crab Feast. You don't fix this matter, nobody can come down to the Toss Crab Feast. You know, and that's, I mean, that should be enough reason to pass the bill. But seriously, it's a tailored bill. It's narrow. Uh, we're working closely with the Department of Transportation. 
and, and it gives the law enforcement and the emergency uh, service folks the opportunity to, during these uh, key times, uh, not year-round, uh, deal with the matter. So it's a problem-solving bill, and we really thank you for your, not just hearing us out, but help us solve the problem, because it affects all of us as Marylanders, because we all go around uh, the state, and uh, the bridge does connect us so that we are one Maryland. So we look forward to working with your subcommittee and with your full committee, and uh, urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. All righty, then. Any questions for this final panel of witnesses? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank we you. Will, that concludes the public hearing on House Bill 688.